Hello comic book fans, unbox your back issues and pull up a chair because we are here to dive into the Dark Phoenix Saga and Lumberjanes, the Infernal Compass. But first, I have to ask you, have you read this yet? Alright, welcome to the first episode of Have You Read This Yet? It is a new show from Kayla Use Decibel. We are going to be discussing comics and how they fit into the pop culture landscape. Uh, before we start on our first uh, uh, comic that we're going to discuss, I'm going to introduce my guests who are brave enough to join me for the first episode. So thank you guys so much for being here. All right, so we are joined by Lila Sturgis, a local writer who has lent her talents to comics like The Justice Society of America, Jack of Fables, and Lumberjanes, which we're going to be discussing here today. We're also joined by Rudy Rainier Govea, a founder of the Austin Comic Book Meetup and Brianna Minx, a local teacher and artist who teaches kids how to make comic books and scenes. So thank you guys so much for joining us for this, uh, we'll say this is an experiment because it's episode one. So uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is Lumberjanes, the Infernal Compass, but before we dive into our spoiler-filled review, I wanna um, ask you, Lila, how did you come to write for this series? Well, I had been approached by Boom Studios to write a comic about uh, the magicians. They were looking for someone to do a Lumberjanes graphic novel, and they needed someone to do it fast. Mm. And my editor said, Lila's really fast, <laughs> so you should let her do it. <laughs> and there is a, um, an understanding in the Lumberjanes world that everyone who works on the book has to be a non cis male. It doesn't have to be, but that's the way it has been. Mm -hmm. And so having me as a trans woman come on the book felt like a very natural fit. And we've got a trans girl character in the book, so that's really nice. Yeah. Um, and so I got pulled into the team that way, and it's been just a magical experience from beginning to end. Can you talk a little bit really quickly about how rare that is to have a um, non size male uh, team working on a comic book? I feel like that is just almost unheard of. It is, and Boom really goes out of their way to have a diverse slate of creators. So many of the people who work on this book are women, um, queer, um, trans men, trans women. It's a really, really diverse creative team and it really shows in the product. So I wanted you guys to tell us really quickly like how you came to find Lumberjanes and was this your first time to read it or have you read like some of the previous um, issues before this? About six years ago, a co-worker of mine told me about it. She was like, oh, it's really fun. There's magical creatures. I'm like, okay, you don't have to tell me. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. Sold. Perfect. Yeah. Rudy, how about yourself? I honestly just started reading, and this is why I got this guy. I am not caught up yet, but I figured <laughs> so this is a I, would, zone. It's okay. I would bring this <laughs> with uh, with me to show you all. Um, I really like it as a queer person of color. Mm -hmm. uh, I identify as a feminist as well, and I just want to see a world where femmes, women, young girls, and non-binary people, and all kinds of people get I don't want to say the spotlight, but a chance to live their lives just as people. They're children, and they're exploring the world, and they're learning about themselves. So it's, I've wanted to get it, but I just hadn't made the time. And now that I have, I'm like, yes, more, <laughs> please. You bring up one of my favorite things about Lumberjanes, which is that it exists in this world where things like misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, they don't really exist. These are children who are allowed to exist in a world where they're free to be exactly who they are with no limits, and it makes for a really beautiful reading experience. That's never the conflict in the story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like that is a perfect segue to dive into our spoiler filled review. So, get your adventure gear together. This is Lumberjanes, the Infernal Compass. We've got adventure, romance, and evil robot butlers. This is Lumberjanes, the Infernal Compass. But let's backtrack a little bit. Who are the Lumberjanes? Meet Joe, Mal, Molly, April, and Ripley. Five scouts at a summer camp for hardcore lady types. They go on adventures, solve mysteries, and you know, occasionally fight supernatural creatures. In this standalone graphic novel, the girls set off to do some orienteering, but Molly isn't just trying to find her way around the woods. She's also trying to navigate her new relationship with Mal. She's worried this new relationship will end with her being alone. That threat becomes literal as the team starts to vanish one by one. They start to realize one of their compasses is the culprit. But despite their plan to keep eyes on each other, Molly winds up alone, lost in the woods. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew has been kidnapped by some very proper British-type robots. This is why you never trust proper British-type robots. 
Molly decides to smash the compass, but she is stopped by Henrietta Nibley, an explorer who happens to be looking for the artifact. The compass, as it turns out, feeds off your fears. And since Molly has been afraid she'll be alone, it made that happen. Henrietta offers to take Molly to her friends, who have been rescued by her robots, if she'll hand over the compass. But back at Henrietta's camp, the crew feels less rescued and more captured. Using the subtle art of being unladylike, the girls make a daring escape. Meanwhile, Molly discovers Henrietta had a similar fear of losing her friends, but decided she was better off alone than actually talking it out. Molly thinks this is stupid and demands the compass back. Henrietta bolts, but who does she immediately run into but the rest of the group about to fight the evil robot butlers. Reunited with her friends, Molly talks her feelings out with Mal, deciding that sharing things is better than dealing with them alone. Things are also smoothed over with Henrietta, who also comes to realize the importance of friendship. But what about the infernal compass? Henrietta hangs onto it, noting that with her friends to keep her on track, it won't have that fear to feed off of. And with that, the girls head off on their next adventure. So I was reading some reviews before we came out here today, and we chatted about this a little bit beforehand, and I know people mean this as a compliment, but something I kept seeing in reviews for the, the overall series was, uh, the series is great, there are five girls, and they're all different. And I'm like, yeah, that's how characters work. They, they probably should be. <laughs> should be a little bit different. But um, talk a little bit about the fact that you do have five female main characters, and they do all have very specific personalities and motivations and traits that they, that they have. They do. Yeah. And one of the things that when you join the Lumberjanes team as a writer, um, you spend a lot of time talking with the editors about, especially Shannon Waters, who's one of the main creators of Lumberjanes, who's also an editor at Boom, about who these characters are and what they want. These are, girls are very real to everyone who works on Lumberjanes, and so we love Ripley. We adore Joe. We, are, we stand Mal and Molly. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of it is just acknowledging that we live in a world where there's lots of different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we want as many of those people to feel included by Lumberjanes as possible, because Lumberjanes is for everybody. Yeah. And I wanted you guys to talk a little bit about that too, like as readers coming into this, um, especially the first time that you picked it up and maybe weren't quite sure like what the story was going to entail, um, were you kind of surprised by the characters and did you kind of come into this thinking like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, I haven't seen a lot of comics like this. Yeah, I think when I picked up like the first issue, I was, I felt like a sense of like relief. Yeah. <laughs> reading yeah, it, yeah. like, wow, I could see something in myself in each of the characters and they were like fully fleshed out. Mm -hmm the baseline to being a good friend yeah. is just like accepting everyone for who they are and that if someone isn't treating you like that they're not a friend I think that's like a great point in Lumberjanes that I love so much yeah Rudy how about yourself um what I really liked as a new reader is um that the girls really do their best to highlight their best attributes they're all clever in very different ways mm -hmm. um there are times when they're like well I can't jump as high or I can't do math as fast or I can't do this I can't do that but you can mm -hmm. and so they're like okay well you take the lead at at this time and you know when you need assistance from the rest of us we'll step up and it's kind of like a turning wheel where there are different circumstances in which a person can shine and yeah. when they do everyone shines. It's like uh, Lizzo says, when I glow, everybody glows. I don't think that's the <laughs> exact word, but you know, I they help each other, and that's what I loved about it the most. I, I love so much you worked in a Lizzo reference. <laughs> I, I feel like, man, we're, this is perfect. If I, if I can work a Lizzo <laughs> reference into every show we do after this, I'm going to be perfectly I mean, happy. That's I'll that's be that's here. That's good, cool. <laughs> well, and that's the Lumberjanes motto, is friendship to the max. It's not right, just yeah. friendship, it's friendship all the way. Yeah. Well, and you, you mentioned this uh, standing, uh, the Mal and Molly relationship. And so something that I very much loved as I was reading through it is that everyone is just like, oh, this is, this, yeah, it's cute. Like, you guys are dating. That's adorable. Um, and, I, and I love that. I love that it was just like a normal thing. Yes. And that's one of the premises of Lumberjanes is that your queerness, <coughs> your transness, whatever you've got that you bring to the table, whatever your identity is, that's a given, and so we want to take the relationships that we see in our lives and put those in stories mm -hmm. so that the people who uh, want stories like that can resonate with them. Yeah, like um, when I was a middle school kid and a little older, I would like actively search out representation in comics, and I would end up in the back of a library not checking things out because I was too afraid. Yeah. Reading stuff that was really age inappropriate <laughs> 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 and tragic and everybody dies or yeah. everybody's 
sinful or the villain or, or they're never going to be happy and mm -hmm. it was just like is this what my life is going to be yeah. so i can think if i had something like lumberjanes mm -hmm. when i was younger living in a really small suburb mm -hmm. that would have been a lot better <laughs> Well, yeah, and I want you to talk a little yeah. bit too about um, for for your students in particular. Um, do they do they gravitate towards this, and is it like what's their reaction to it? It depends on the students, since I go in and out of different schools. Sure. Um, last summer, I was working at a summer camp, and a young boy like borrowed every single one of my lumberjanes mm -hmm. trades and wanted to talk to me about like what's going on with Joe, what's this, what's that. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that's really cool. Um, other kids gravitate, gravitate towards more towards the superheroes, but I think what's great about um, teaching comics in the way that I teach them is the ability to show that, that wide variety of everything from superheroes to the really super indie stuff and to say, your story is the right story to tell mm -hmm. and get that Aww. idea to kids really early. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, actually, this is a really great point. To, uh, I wanted to um, kind of touch on just LGBTQ representation overall in comics uh, before we move on to, to our next uh, book for the, the f this first episode. And when we were starting to look at this, um, you know, as a topic, I was racking my brain trying to think of the first time in a mainstream, like, Marvel DC comic I saw a character that was out. And it was a thing that the other characters were aware of, knew about. It wasn't something that just, like, the writer was thinking as they were making the character. And I think it was probably within the last 10 to 15 years. Like, it, it's still a, like, kind of a newer thing. So I was curious, like, if you guys would tell me, like, what was the first time you remember seeing a character that was part of the LGBTQ community that was a recognized thing within the book? Especially for a mainstream book. Indies <laughs> have been a little bit better about this, but. I don't remember very clearly. Mm. Um, it's in the book Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Oh, yeah. And this was 30 years ago. Um, and there's good and bad to that. There are LGBTQ characters in Sandman, there are queer women, there's a trans woman, um, and that's great, but at the same time, because everyone in the industry writing mainstream comics at that time was a straight, cisgender, white man, mm -hmm. what you have is characters that are included, maybe in Gaiman's case, for kind of hipster cred. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they're not real representations of these characters mm -hmm. um, and the representation is not great. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing over time is more LGBTQ creators coming into comics and being able to actually create comics. Yeah. And now you have writers like um, Vita Ayala, you mm -hmm. have people like um, Nagata Kabi who um, made a big splash with my lesbian experience of loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, who are actually telling the stories of themselves and not lifting other people's stories mm -hmm. to repackage for a mainstream audience. Yeah. Rihanna, how about yourself? Well, in mainstream comics, as far as that goes, it would be Green Lantern. When uh. Kyle Rayner was Green Lantern, he had like this assistant, I think. Mm -hmm. And this was like 15 years ago or so. And the assistant like had a crush on him or whatever. And I read like all of it just because, like I said, I was really desperate to see myself in yeah. something, and I was like, this is the closest I'm gonna get, I guess. Right, but yeah. it was very sad, and it was very, like, mm -hmm. pining after the unavailable, and like a side character who doesn't really matter, who, I, I don't want to spoil her, but like, bad <laughs> stuff happens <laughs> to them. Right. And well, like and we can talk about that a little bit too, but there, there definitely, I think, was a theme for a while of sort of like the burying your gaze. If you did have a character that was LGBTQ, it was sort of like, okay, we have this character, but really terrible things are going to happen to them. Don't get attached. It seemed like that was very much like a trend. The first time I saw an out uh, queer person was actually a Green Lantern. It was Alan Scott. Yeah. A, he was a reimagined version of the JSA, of the Justin Society's Green Lantern, the original Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, he actually got buried. Like the yeah. story right away, um, like I think it's the second page of that first issue. He is seeing, embracing, and kissing his partner. Um, Alan himself is a cis, white, blonde, blue eyed mm -hmm. gay man. You know, he's a millionaire. Yeah. And his <laughs> partner is a person of color. Yeah. Um, and that second issue, it's like, oh, okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll see you later. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I was like, oh, okay, well, at least he's gay. But as a queer person of color, I'm like, oh, okay, so mm. we're the, where's, where's the non-white people? Yeah. And so, yeah, like, burying your gaze was totally a mm. thing that I experienced. I remember when that happened, being on Twitter mm -hmm. and everyone being mad. And then, like, the, 
the company line was like, don't worry, it's okay. Yeah. This is alternate universe. Don't worry. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what sort of worry? I feel like actually that got used a lot too. Um, I remember when uh, I think the first character that I remember was a member of the LGBTQ community, and they were recognizing that was in uh, the Ultimate X Men with Colossus, and they just, and like, he I think had a boyfriend for a short period of time. But it, but that was I think a line yeah. that Marvel used. Don't quote me, Internet. I could be wrong, but I think that that was a line they used. Like, oh no no, it's not the main universe. So it's okay. Don't get mad, yeah. and that was definitely like a line they kind of towed. Mm. I, if I may add something though, with um, queer baiting, I don't yeah. know if you yeah. guys know what that term means. So it's basically where you have a character that you kind of push a little bit on the queer spectrum, whether they're straight or queer or whatever. Um, something that I really stand for are Helena Wayne Huntress and mm -hmm. Kara Sorrell uh, Power Girl. I feel their friendship was like just such a like girl power duo, but sometimes their interactions are like, are they flirting? Like, <laughs> right. what is happening there? I'm like, please keep flirting. Yeah. Like, you guys and are. And as queer so people, great. we're trained to, or we've trained ourselves to kind of imagine these stories, build these stories in, in the interstices of mm -hmm. the canonical stories. Mm -hmm. So I think that queer baiting plays into that really well. Yeah. yeah. To talk about non superhero comics, um, Tova Jansen, who wrote Moomin, mm -hmm. is a queer woman who lived with her partner. And um, it's a kid's book, but like, you read it and you can read into like all these things about acceptance and loving yourself and you're like oh I'm just reading into this but then years later like all the things that were put in the media like oh she just lives by herself on an island is like no she meant to put that in there so mm -hmm. like in the past it like queer creators coded it in too so that might be why we're used to reading it yeah mm -hmm. Well, and I wanted to ask you guys a little bit about where do you think uh, we are now in terms of representation and how much further do we still have to go? I think we're at an inflection point mm. where big corporations are realizing that that rainbow dollar spends. Right. And <laughs> <coughs> so they want to pivot towards that in some way without also alienating people who are bigoted. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you have a whole new generation of creators, and these are all the people who, this is sort of my second career in comics. I had a whole, a whole other career under a previous name, mm -hmm. um, and now I've sort of come back since transitioning. Um, and I feel like I'm part of this younger generation of creators yeah. who are much more openly queer. Um, there's a lot of women, um, a lot of non-binary people. And these are people who are not as ready to take no for an answer in terms of what they want to do and the kind of books that they want to write. Mm -hmm. And this is the field of creators that the big two is going to be pulling from in the coming years. So I think over time you're going to be seeing a lot more of this sort of stuff, a lot more representation and visibility in the mainstream because the mainstream draws from independent comics yeah. um, and the younger crowd. Nice. Rihanna, what do you think? Yeah, with mainstream comics, like the thing that I always think about is publication is a business, so that's why it's taken so long. And now that, like Lila said, now that rainbow dollars are seen as selling, um, it is definitely growing in that way. And it, I think it's amazing how new, younger um, artists and creators are pushing to make more authentic stories. So I think it is going to be a lot greater too. I feel that we need to be at the table to be heard. Um, so I am hopeful, and I agree with you, the younger, newer uh, industry people, they're just like, let's do it, we're here, let's, let's just bang this out. So I'm really hopeful that we see some changes in the future. Well, it feels like, uh, since we're already talking about the big two houses, it seems like a good time to sort of turn the corner and talk about something completely different from everything that we've just been talking about <laughs> and discuss the Dark Phoenix saga. You probably heard about a little movie that just came out called X-Men The Dark Phoenix. This is probably the third time that the cosmic force has been adapted for film or TV, but they're all roughly based on this particular story arc, the Dark Phoenix Saga, and as we are about to see, it's a little bit different than its silver screen reincarnations. Don't you hate it when you're trying to get your life back on track, but then some guy starts playing mind games with you just so he can use the near infinite cosmic power living inside you, and then you destroy a planet? We've all been there, right? This is the Dark Phoenix Saga. Written by Chris Claremont and art by John Byrne, the Dark Phoenix Saga ran through issue 129 to 138 in the Uncanny X-Men. It's possibly one of the best known X-Men story arcs, and it's been adapted for screens both big and small more than once. The Dark Phoenix has come to destroy you all! 
And it all boils down to this. Does absolute power corrupt absolutely? Spoiler alert, it definitely does. The story comes on the heels of the Phoenix Saga, where the original ex-lady, Jean Grey, has conjoined with the Phoenix Force, a cosmic entity of creation and destruction, often driven by pure impulse. The Phoenix Force is one of the most powerful and most feared fiends in the universe. This is a lot of power to have running around in your head, so Jean has voluntarily put mental blocks on herself to tamp down the Phoenix's powers. But someone wants her to give in to those impulses. Jason Weingard, a member of the Hellfire Club and also known as Mastermind. He starts brainwashing Jean so he can control her and thinks the best way to do this is by making Jean think she's a British loyalist during the Revolutionary War and also married to him? So anyway, this works and her brief stint as the Hellfire Club's Black Queen pushes the Phoenix Force's impulses into overdrive. Jean becomes the Dark Phoenix, a being driven only by want and desire. She turns on the X-Men in order to sever Jean's remaining ties to humanity, and then shoots across the cosmos, deep into Shi'ar space. Okay, it's worth noting the Shi'ar are not big fans of the Phoenix Force. It destroyed a bunch of their planets, before Jean Grey, it's been like a whole thing. The Dark Phoenix consumes a nearby star, causing it to supernova, and it destroys a planet, killing billions. A Shi'ar vessel tries to fight her, but it's quickly destroyed. In their final moments, they contact the Empire and confirm their worst fears. The Phoenix Force has returned. Meanwhile, Jean Grey has returned to Earth. During a brief fight with the X-Men, Professor Xavier manages to replace the mental blocks holding the Phoenix Force back, and the gene that they know and love resurfaces. But you know who's not interested in happy reunions? These guys! Cause, you know, that whole blowing up a planet thing. After some debate, it's decided the X-Men will fight the Shi'ar Imperial Guard for the fate of Jean Grey. If the X-Men win, she goes free. And if they lose, Jean dies. And they start losing, like, badly. While all this is going on, Jean can feel the psychic blocks failing and the Dark Phoenix resurfacing. She uses the final shards of her humanity to destroy herself and thereby save literally the entire universe. A heartbroken team returns to Earth, but this is definitely not the last encounter the team has with this cosmic entity. The Phoenix Force has returned to the series multiple times over the years, sometimes resuscitating Jean Grey or fusing with her relatives. Uh, one time it divided itself up between five of the X-Men, but it's always something beautiful and terrible to behold and it always returns from its own constant destruction. Kind of like, well, you know. The first question that I had for you guys about the Dark Phoenix Saga, um, I was curious what uh, your first experience with it was. Did you read the comics first? Did you see it in like the cartoon from the 90s? Like what was the first time you got introduced to this like particular story? The first time I ever read the Dark Phoenix Saga was in the comics. Okay. Um, the X-Men comics of this time uh, are this amazing soap opera that's just this ongoing melodrama of craziness and that was a big, a big deal yeah. in the comics then. Yeah. Brianna, how about yourself? Um, I think I saw the X-Men animated series. Right. And then shortly after, read the comics. Nice, yeah. okay. What do you hear about you? The cartoon as well. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I recently rewatched. I think it's like four episodes. The animation's not great, but this is still a good story. <laughs> it holds up. Like, also, yeah. that song is burned into your brain now. Like, yeah. you, I guarantee you everyone here could probably hum the, the animated theme song, like, <laughs> on command, for sure. X-Men, they've been my, like, WB, now CW. Right, In yeah. the geek realm. Like, they just, I'm, I'm there for the drama. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm here to be messy, and 100%. let's do it. Yeah. I do, I do love, um, and I, I haven't read enough of the issues before this series uh, to know kind of where the, rela the weird relationship triangle is between you know, Gene and Scott and Wolverine. So there are definitely those melodrama moments yeah. where it's like, that's happening. That's a <laughs> thing that's going on. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you guys too, like, why do you think this particular story arc, of all of the X-Men story arcs, always gets adapted? Because it is the, uh, the the movie that just came out. It is the second movie where they have tackled the Phoenix Force. Um, but why do you guys think it's this one that always gets revisited? I think it's a really good story, just in and of itself. Mm. But I think there's also something that really gets at us. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Yeah. The idea that a woman with a lot of power mm -hmm. is a very dangerous thing. 
And for me, you asked what's it like coming back to it. There's this feeling that like, you know, your feminism renders everything problematic in retrospect, right? right? And that's one of the things to me, it's like, oh, there's a little bit of misogyny here. Um, mm -hmm. A woman who gets very powerful, well, of course she's gonna turn evil, right? Like, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, so, that's yeah. kind of strange, but yeah. I think that there's something about that that hits us on a very gut level. Mm -hmm. And so how we react to that, there's power to it. Yeah. The part of the story that I keep thinking about is from like a mental illness standpoint and like oh, sort of the, what do you do when you're overwhelmed with your own self and mm -hmm. how, how are other people going to treat you and are they going to try to control you or are they going to try to help you figure this out sort yeah. of thing. That's really interesting. I hadn't yeah. thought about it from that perspective, though. But yeah, that, that's really fascinating, that idea of sort of struggling with something uh, internal that maybe other people are not yeah. aware of as much. That's a really interesting aspect to it. Rudy, what do you think? Uh, for me, I also view it from a feminist lens. Mm -hmm. uh, what just bothered me about it was the Hellfire Club and how they were manipulating Jean. Right, um, yeah. So with the Hellfire Club, they're like, we're going to go after Jean Grey. Why? Because she's powerful. But mm -hmm. she's a woman, so she can be manipulated. Right. And so when I think about the story, I'm like, OK, this is a really strong, really powerful person. Mm -hmm. But these things are happening to her because she is a woman who is also white, who is able-bodied, and who can be someone that the reader, who tends to be men, mm -hmm. can or would like to rescue but they also want to mm -hmm. see her be vulnerable. Yeah. And so that's where I'm like, it's a good story, but mm -hmm. like the components to it, like yeah. what what are we really kind of putting out there? Yeah, and even from a mental illness standpoint, there's a hi been history in literature of romanticizing it, especially in white women, mm -hmm. going all the way back to the Victorian era and just like having consumption being seen as a desirable thing. and being yeah sickly and needing to be taken care of so it like, yeah. all ties in together. Well I think too if we look at like the, the many different uh, hosts for the for the Phoenix Force over the, the run of the series like it, it's almost constantly I'm trying I'm struggling to think of any time when it is not a woman and not a white woman usually one of her relatives it is always like a cousin <laughs> or like her clone or like that's kind of standard comic book fare usually like there's a clone there's always a clone I think that's like a standard comic book rule someone has a clone <laughs> somewhere for you at all times but uh, yeah but there's rarely is it anybody but someone who fits this very specific uh, look ultimately it was Emma Frost again another mm -hmm. uh, thin able-bodied white woman yeah. and with her the emphasis was less on like let's rescue her more on like oh she's dangerous because mm -hmm. she pushes her boobies out <laughs> and she makes me want to <laughs> you know ravage her but she will cut me if yeah. I go near her so that was the paradigms too like if I may throw a Buffy reference here oh, please blonde do. Buffy versus brunette faith right. like that was the yin yang kind of thing that people often play out and uh, with women being powerful but women never having powerful friends that are women they they tend to always have to disagree or fight with one another. Well, I think even mm. we see in the series, it is the, the first introduction we have to Emma Frost. Also, uh, Kitty Pride and Dazzler. Uh, yes. So we get some sort of like fun yes. intros for people here. Uh, but like she, I think uh, Emma Frost is alive for like what two uh, issues, and then like she's uh, assumed dead by the end of the series. Like she's buried under some rubble, and they're like, "Oh, that happened. Too bad for her." <laughs> it's important to remember that even though we we come at this hard from maybe you know an intersectional lens sure. um, or from a mental illness perspective that doesn't mean we can't enjoy these stories it doesn't mean they're terrible it doesn't mean we have to cancel everything right um, I just want to make that clear because I think sometimes we 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 look at this stuff and we go oh well just forget it then you know like mm -hmm. but no we don't need to forget it we don't need right. to forget it we just need to be aware of aware of what it's doing mm -hmm. and the choices that it's making and the reason why it's making those choices. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, for, for me, I would say the story doesn't end when you finish the book, because mm -hmm. uh, you're a consumer now, but your imagination is infinite. So you might be a consumer today, but maybe upon reading this book or other books, you might become a creator in the future. And so, you know, keep with the culture, learn from the past, but remember that you can tell your own stories later on. That is a perfect note to end it on. I don't think we could have summed it up any nicer than that. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for our very first episode. Uh, Thank you. I also want to send a shout out to Austin Books and Comics for letting us take over their space for today for this first episode. Um, and thank you guys especially for watching. Um, is there a comic that you would like us to talk about? Let us know. Leave us a comment. Also, subscribe and like this channel to see more uh, comic book information and news. Also, more just Central Texas news. We do both. We're multi-talented that way. Thanks, everybody, and we will see you next time.